Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to be talking about esports today. My name is John Gattiosi. I've been covering the esports space for Fortune and other outlets since the uh, inception of esports. And we're going to real quickly have each one of our panelists do a quick intro, and then we're going to actually show you guys a quick video as well to give you a sense of what esports is all about. Hi, my name is Sean Charles. I look after industry relationships, so basically what the ESL, one of the uh, largest organizations in esports, does and how do they work together with the industry that basically is esports and gaming at the moment. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Chris Mead. I look after partnerships for EMEA at Twitch and just to give you a quick idea of what partnerships is, it's essentially working with our content creators. These can be um, broadcasters to esports companies, um, to publishers, to developers. Um, and for those of you that don't actually know what, what Twitch is, it's uh, you know, the world's leading social video platform and community for, for gamers. Hi there, my name is Peter Warman. I was on stage uh, an hour ago. I head up a company called New Zoo, which is located three minutes crawling distance from here. And we try to be the best in esports intelligence and uh, also think with indies what the bigger trends mean for their business. My name is Wouter. I'm the CEO of Fnatic. Fnatic, one of the largest esports organizations in terms of teams, competitive teams um, uh, globally. Uh, we started in 2004 with teams in games like Painkiller and Quake. Uh, today we have a team in League of Legends, Counter-Strike, um, in, uh, well, until recently, Battlefield 4, Heroes of the Storm, um, Smite, and uh, so currently a roster of five. Um, if you don't mind, so I would like to kick off the uh, panel with a question to the audience, and that is, whom of you has ever been at a live esports event, a stadium event? <laughs> wow, I expected less, to be honest. Anyway, I'm still going to show the video, um, and that will be part of our discussion further. And of course, now it can't play. Um, it just did, actually. First month of the year, like I wasn't even like thinking about the world. For me, I was a bit worried for the world because it's like first time world for my uh, career. We are not afraid of any strong team. So whoever would show up, we have to play against them, and we're ready for that. and the figures etc but I thought it was also important to show what the experience of the players the audience and kind of like what makes the product of esports for this discussion and and I know not everyone necessarily was here an hour ago so I do want to start with giving having Peter just gives a sense of how big esports is today and how you see that growing in five years just to give people an idea of the size and scope okay yeah um, a brief Sorry, then. Yeah, the hard figure. Sorry, uh, Walter, this will be the, the last time in this panel. <coughs> well, no, um, esports, in the real professional scene of esports, has about an audience of about 115 million uh, this year. Uh, the good news is that there's another group, equally uh, equal in size, that watches occasionally. And actually, I'm one of the latter group. So, <coughs> um, a total audience of about a quarter of a billion people, uh, growing towards um, uh, 300 million uh, rapidly. And the money going around in esports, the real uh, professional scene, is close to half a billion this year and expect uh, to reach um, a billion about in 2019. But there are scenarios, if you look at the monetization of traditional sports, that could accelerate that. Because in basketball, 
uh, per fan, $15 is generated every year. In esports, that stands at um, $3. So there's a lot of scenarios that could take a positive route. To a route. And I also want to remind the people that there's the emotion and the, the technology that makes esports so big at the moment are things that impact and provide opportunities for indies as well. You will have viewers, you're, you have to let people create with your game, and you'll have gamers, and treating those three communities equally uh, will provide opportunities. So it's not only the narrow definition of esports that I think we should talk about. When it comes to uh, esports today, as a journalist, every game developer and publisher is always telling me they've got the next esports title. Uh, when it comes to the current landscape, how much room is there for, for new esports titles? And, and how do you see that expanding if you look, look, look ahead? And we'll start with ESL, since you guys have to make these decisions in terms of what's an esports title and, wh and where's the community out there for it? Um, simply put, I mean, ESL obviously is a community first and foremost. It's a place where people play together just like any kind of league is. And um, to that effect, you know, we're not actually the ones who decide which game should or shouldn't become an, an eSports. We're not sitting anywhere. I don't have a crystal ball and can say this will work, this won't. There are a lot of examples of games that have become very successful that people thought within the company, within the larger space, it wouldn't be successful. We don't know. The only thing we can do is put those games out and give them the largest and the broadest platform to reach the widest playing or professionally or uh, semi-professionally or amateur professional playing field of players out there and let them decide themselves. Once the game is kind of offered up to our community, the community will decide, is this game fun? Which game type works? Um, how will this game be played? Where will this game be played? Will it live predominantly online, offline? Do people want to see each other? Do they want to shout at each other? Every community is different. The COD community is entirely different from the StarCraft community in a million and one ways. We don't really decide that, we just nurture it. And so it's very much up to the community, which probably segues nicely over to my, my compadre here yeah. to talk about. It is really how that community picks up and runs with a game. Um, and that's something which I think is true for every game that's out there. So the more games, the merrier, and the community will ultimately decide which ones of those games they want to keep and which ones they want to support. And what role does Twitch play in, in fostering the community and figuring out which games of, of it will ultimately become esports titles? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was just going to completely 100% agree with Sean in terms of the community. Um, it, it is the community at the end of the day. It's, you know, I think it's the million dollar question for, for publishers and developers at the moment. You know, how do we create an esports title? I think for them, I think in the last five to six years, we've seen um, developers and publishers actually start to think about how esports plays a role in game development itself. Um, and I think we'll, we'll start to see that take shape within the next five years as well. Um, in terms of the role Twitch plays, um, you know, we, we were there very much from the start. Um, you know, Twitch actually is almost a product of esports in a sense, as uh, our CEO, uh, Emmett Shear, um, basically set up Twitch because, um, you know, firstly, for first and foremost, is his love of uh, uh, StarCraft II, but also um, the, the notice in the community actually taking up and watching community uh, competitive play. Um, ever since, uh, we've really just helped to try and, and, and help and, and foster the ecosystem as much as possible, whether that's supporting uh, broadcasters, esports companies, um, with sponsorships and so forth. Um, and, and really, Twitch is, is very much the home there of that community too. I would <clears throat> kind of like uh, to add to that. I think um, already now, you, you, esports need, you could say like, you know, it's becoming a little bit of a buzzword and people see that as a, maybe as a vehicle to, you know, launch their game and increase gameplay, etc. cetera. Um, for us with Fnatic, I would say the, the, the question is the same as with EZL. We, we could have teams in probably in 20 different games, uh, but that wouldn't make sense for us. So first of all, we would also be looking at audience. So how, you know, we see ourselves in a way as a brand, uh, more than just a team brand. Um, and indeed, so the, the scatter map that was shown uh, for Twitch about, you know, why are we currently not present in Hearthstone? It's partially also because, you know, we are already reaching out to League of Legends fans and who are also watching Hearthstone. Um, so I think there are two sides to this question. Is one, um, it, a few months back, um, a person from Smite had given a really good presentation about what are the 10 ingredients uh, to create an esports title. And it hit on some really good points. 
Um, so it's about the ecosystem, the in-game monetization. It's of course about how skill levels build up, etc. But on top of that, a very important part is of course how you create uh, the viewer experience. And I think one important thing about esports is not only about the competitive play, and even that people are, you know, watching it because maybe they want to improve their gameplay. They actually enjoy the viewing experience as a viewing experience, not necessarily because they want to improve their gameplay. So I think that is kind of like nowadays important to realize for esports, if you look at it, is really to think from a viewing experience um, in addition to the mechanical or game mechanics that makes up an esports title. Do you think that Rocket League or FIFA would make a better esport? Um, <laughs> I would need to go through the ten, ten ingredients, what makes up, uh, I, I, I don't have a clear answer to that, to be honest, right now, but um, I do think, if you look at the track record so far, that maybe um, Rocket League has, has more potential, if you look at the history, and one of the things that we've experienced ourselves with Fnatic as an organization is that we're better able to manage teams than individual players, for example. Um, so it's also to build a certain consistency in the gameplay and how we contribute to that as a brand. But, you know, I would, it's not a straightforward answer, but I would say that's my first response. It, it, actually, last year there were 200 different franchises that had prize money in esports activities, real prize money tournaments. So there's a lot of indeed by the community set up themselves, and you know publishers come to us. Do you think we should make our game an esport? And look at your community. If they're not actively twitching or not organizing stuff themselves already, just don't don't bother. I, I think to add to that is that there's you know many roads lead to Rome. So you could say right, we want to go after you know the fanatics of this world. What's going to pull them out of the water? Potentially a large return on investment. You will start creating a team if potentially there's a lot of money for that team to win because. You also want to get exposure, sponsorship, etc. If that's already in the water, that might be a reason to pull somebody out. It could be in the case of Rocket League, it's just an incredibly uh, sticky, fun, almost second to understand what's going on, and then an infinite lifetime to master how to play that game well, which makes it great for the Twitch audience. Any one of these pieces will work to making a game in esports, and any collection of those together make that kind of perfect recipe that makes an esports last forever. What that relationship is, that's obviously the, the, the million dollar question. If anybody could answer that, then they'd probably be doing pretty great. But the combination of whether it's the, the professional side, the streaming side, people watching that content, that's what, you, what you're looking for. And ultimately, the most, the first and foremost, it needs to be a good game. Because I would argue there won't ever be an esports title that's on a really janky, broken game. That's pong, what we do know. Pong esports. Pardon? Pong esports. I would like that. I would I, I'm all for just, that. Um, sorry, we're going to like. But um, I think actually Vanglory is, an, is a, a, a brilliant example, like today, about, okay, you know, people might debate is this an esports title because it's a mobile and we're so used to PC. Um, and yeah, as Fnatic, we're actively looking into that and see if it makes sense for us to have a team uh, in Vanglory. And, you know, it starts to become more and more interesting because there's, of course, a growing audience. Um, there's, you know, proactive engagement and investment from Vanglory themselves in the tournament series. Um, they're working on the product, on uh, the viewing experience, etc. And in addition, as like Peter shows also with the figures, like it's um, in particular popular in China, as I understood. And I go like, that makes sense for us because we, we have a fan base in China, but obviously not as much as we would like to have it to be. And then it starts to make sense for us to actually take an investment and have a team and the support around it. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's like I, I'm going to keep harping on about community and, and, and that's pretty much what I do. But I, I think it is just so vital in terms of, you know, potentially one day defining what those ingredients are to make what an, uh, an esports title. Um, I mean, you, you know, I don't think anybody could have envisioned a, a Warcraft 3 modification actually turning out to be one of the biggest you know, esports of today. So, um, likewise, you know, at Twitch, we've we've really noticed that trend in terms of working with developers specifically. Um, that we've actually got what we call now a developer success program, just so that we can help developers really get in tune with the Twitch community. Um, and and to do that, uh, you know, there, there's so many ways that, that that that's actually possible. So, yeah. And Peter, you you mentioned during your talk and just now, uh, FIFA. What what role do you guys feel? traditional sports video games. We, we saw uh, NBA 2K just entered the space. 
uh, of esports. We've seen Madden over the years involved in FIFA, uh, especially with connecting with the more mainstream audience, because out there you always see comparisons between esports and real sports and trying to explain it to people that don't understand what esports is. So from that perspective, what role do, do you see sports video games playing in the ecosystem moving forward? Any, it's open to anybody. I would like to pass that on to, to Sean, and I'll give it a little think. It's a very difficult one. If, uh, yeah, Sean, you first. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to kind of fall back on what I said before, but it depends on how good and how well supported the game is. Um, without giving too many examples, there are some games out there that I would consider to be stalwarts of the gaming community that still have a um, blatant lack of you know, really support for online play. And by that I mean something like a custom lobby where I can choose one person and another person and stuff them into a digital lobby together to play a game where one loses, wins, what have you, and it can be recorded and we can go on to the next round, which ultimately is you know, the backbone of playing any kind of online competition. Um, as long as those games, and s some of them are the ones you just mentioned, um, continue to kind of not support and really develop a robust tool around that for whether it be us to use as a league organizer or for the professionals to use so they can practice and scrim against other professionals and for um, the guys on the Twitch end to be able to stream that content and, content and actually make something worthwhile for that community we spoke about to watch. As long as that's not there, you're never going to give that game the chance that we spoke about. So ultimately, you know, we don't really know, and there's a couple of games yeah. that you can touch on that, that that maybe fall into that category. Yeah, well, we all heard that EA is, you know, they have their own their division, putting Peter Moore on it, and but actually the titles that they expect most from, we don't even know who, they are developing new titles for esports. Yes, they will be pushing for FIFA and and the NBA thing. Personally, I think if you look at the Twitch or YouTube viewership, for instance, at a certain moment there were more viewers of FIFA unpacking the digital cards within FIFA Ultimate Team, more videos watched than of nice plays within the game. So that, that makes you think, you know, are we creating enough cool moments and exciting moments that people are going to talk about or come to stadiums about or stream about? And I think that's where um, realistic games maybe are a little bit um, lacking be honest, traditional sports can be pretty boring. Um, so, but it, it's a big, a big question. We're going to find, find out this year because I think the first million dollar prize pool will be present at a, a FIFA game or an NBA game. So we'll, we'll find out. Yeah, I, I think Peter touched on a really good point in terms of moments. So in terms of, yeah. um, you know, viewer, viewer experience, whether it's spectator friendly, and then you can go back and you can actually um, break down why is FIFA such a popular game to watch on, on Twitch and other platforms, um, yet it's not competitive. Well, it, when, you look, when you break it down, it's actually the social element that, that's absolutely key, right? So when, when these uh, FIFA content creators are taking out their cards and they're, they're, you know, they're finding out the next best player, that's, that's, that's a moment and that's a social experience that's shared with the broadcaster and the audience. Now, how you replicate that, I think that's the question. I think, you know, I'm sure that the, you know, the developers and publishers of this game are looking at that. Um, but I definitely feel that, um, you know, there is space in, you know, within the wider esports industry for these types of games to thrive. It's just finding that point with the community as to creating those moments. At the time that uh, Riot Games introduced League of Legends to the world, they were an indie developer. Uh, when you look at the esports landscape, what opportunities do you see for indie developers to create the next big esports title? Anybody? Um, I think it's absolutely almost falls squarely on the shoulder of indie games because um, they're so quick to market, they're normally so um, hungry and adaptive into what's actually working, they're, they're very... Um, yeah, I would say um, open to the new medium that, for, for example, streaming broadcast, which uh, represents, um, I think that they're absolutely the place where we'll see it. It's just, you know, it's obviously there's a lot of them and trying to get a lot of them in front of a lot of people, that's, that's, a, that's a difficult part, but we're, we're definitely uh, uh, working on it. And, you know, you see games like Brawlhalla, Speedrunners, um, these are all smaller titles, independent studios, um, but their games find um, an audience and that audience, if it's healthy and if it starts creating content it will grow it'll snowball and you'll slowly see it uh, go over time that can be a slow burn or in the case of again we use the rocket league example incredibly fast burn but um they both definitely have that and i think 
uh, to a certain extent, the adaptiveness and the quickness of those uh, smaller independent studios to, to pick up and run with the kind of the esports and the community side of that um, is something that the larger studios and the larger publishers of the AAA games could probably learn a lot from. I would add to that. There's, of course, opportunity for everyone, but I think there's one thing to remember, and it's, it's again, reason why I'm showing this footage. I think you need to have big ambitions, right? If you, if you have that ambition for an eSports title, then have the ambition to create the same excitement that I just saw in the video um, with your game. So it's not only the gameplay, it's actually, you know, picture yourself or your game into this stadium, you know, maybe organized by ESL and thousands of people coming to the stadium and actually coming there to watch people playing that game. And I think that is like the big ambition you need to have and then taking small steps towards it. And then I think, you know, that opportunity is there very much for everyone. Um, so I think that that is more the mindset if you're serious about, you know, creating an esports title, even if you capture just a part of that excitement. And so uh, you'll come very far. Yeah. On, oh, go ahead. Yeah. But you have to, um, you have to have time. I mean, indies have time on their hand, hopefully, and, and or a lot of money uh, to accelerate that process. So building a community takes time. Uh, don't forget that the money put in by publishers into the esports economy is not even half recouped at the moment across the board, you know? So um, there's, there's a lot of money being pumped in to make it into a very visible esports. So. Just before we, we kind of get onto the, like the AAA bashing, which is fine, of course, but just I just want to create some that, controversy, Sean. It's obviously that they have entirely different business models. The, the large publishers are still very much focused around the kind of the bricks and mortar kind of approach of, hey, there's a street date. I've got to you know, recoup, as you said, that massive investment of this you know, 100-man studio somewhere in the world. It's got to ho go turn around quickly. And that doesn't lend itself to the potentially um, slow burn of a community, of, of finding that community falling in love and having that game really become important to you. When a game is perhaps uh, made by a smaller, more flexible studio that doesn't have that, that kind of end mo uh, point of where they have to answer to shareholders, investors, uh, you know, uh, publicly um, um, uh, divulge all of their profit and loss, etc., they have a little bit more time to take that chance and see where does that develop. Um, and then if we look at the way those games are monetized, when you're hitting the kind of the classical street dates, if you're saying I've now got to go and out and find 69.99 quickly, quickly out of millions of people, um, that doesn't really allow for a lot of room of let's test things out. That's normally how do we just tell you that game is there, buy that game, let's make some money out of it. Whereas when you're working in something which perhaps might be free to play or have some sort of microtransactions behind it, you have a little bit more time to mess around there and naturally as your audience grows, so will hopefully the revenue that you make out of the game. So that kind of slow burn of building up that esports community actually goes quite nicely with the, the openness of a microtransaction, which is obviously often uh, the way that indie developers uh, go about things. And <coughs> sorry, <laughs> um, I think of course also maybe it's a bit my marketing background, but it's, think, it's important to think about the branding as well, because there's obviously different ways to monetize. It's in game, um, you know. Take again maybe um, a simple examples: Angry Birds. You know, maybe they make more money out of their franchising or licensing, and and so. Um, than they do from the actual game. So I'm not saying that should maybe be your ambition, but in order to create the opportunities for yourself uh, to grow and scale up, then you know, think for your, for your game as well as a brand that you can market. Um, and, and again, how would that be if you would you know, create some kind of merchandising around it, or you know, would that be an example? Yeah, I was, was going to say it's, it's really difficult for, for indie game developers at the moment because I think they have so many other challenges that they're, that they're contending with. I think Sean and, and Peter are right in, in the sense that um, monetization is, is a big thing, right? And, and even for developers that are f solely focused on esports, monetization is the big thing, right? How does the business model look in three to five years? I think that picture is starting to paint itself slowly now. Um, but but the, the main advantage indie developers have right now is, is um, the connection with their community, right? So, um, you know, to go back, Sean was talking about barriers, that, you know, they have very limited barriers, but they have that connection with, with the community, which I think is, is the main advantage that they can use. And, and it doesn't even need to be about creating an eSport title that's, that's centric to their positioning. It just is just about really iterating their game based on community feedback. And, and, and they can do that on, on platforms like Twitch now, which is, which is the great thing because it removes that barrier too. 
We've seen uh, last year uh, the acquisition of MLG by Activision Blizzard and also EA stepping full into esports. What impact do you see publishers like that getting involved directly in esports having on the ecosystem as we look ahead? Okay, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, massive, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I think the, the key thing to note is that they own the IP, so they own the game, right? So, you know, um, uh, when, when, when you talk about, uh, when, you, when you ask Sean or myself, like, you know, how do we define an eSports title? It's actually not us that defines eSports. We help define that, um, but really, at the end of the day, it's the, it's the publishers and developers that define um, the title itself, right? So, um, they, they've got a massive role. Yeah, that reflects how strategic it is to treat your viewer community as um, with the same care as your player community, uh, and the thirdly, your creators or streamers or Twitchers. And I think uh, the moves that Tencent and Activision Blizzard are making show that they realize that this is a strategic thing that might make them a Disney, so bring them to um, a bigger level of growth that they would never have achieved by only publishing and monetizing games. I would, <clears throat> so, um, kind of like anecdotally, but we know that some of those are, are kind of like eyeing what the UEC is doing, for example, as a model, like, they really own the whole ecosystem, and, you know, they own the IP of the Octagon, they own the content, they wouldn't say they own the, the fighters, but there's a high level of control and so. Um, would it work for esports? I don't think so, because for that, the, the ecosystem is way too diverse. Um, you know, you wouldn't be able to put an esports title, game title, similar to what you see as to MMA. But I guess, you know, the reality will be somewhere in between. If you look at, I can't look into Blizzard's strategy, but obviously they will want to own a, more of the value chain of the ecosystem. And so in a way they create, indeed, they're circumventing their own IP. Um, having the game plus the tournaments and so they'll own more of the content, etc. So I think it will be definitely more competitive, but I would say luckily with eSports, um, there are so many different kind of titles that but it, in the end it's about, about the community really likes or the community and the audience. And I would say that's key. So even if Blizzard would go wrong in terms of creating the wrong format or not developing or not be competitive, people will go somewhere else. And then their investment will, of course, you know, devalue um, if they're not attracting the audiences they're looking for. And I have a theory. I think all the power will shift to the teams and not to the publishers. What do you think? <laughs> have you been looking into our strategy? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, but but I, honestly I'm said, of course, for us, um, as Fnatic, as a team in the ecosystem, said I've been speaking before more about brand. Um, for us, it's a lot about what the brand means uh, for our fans. But you know, not only Fnatic fans, but for esports enthusiasts. And that's the strongest thing we can have, is, you know, is in a way a piece of the brand loyalty, people like what we're doing, etc. And and that's what we're working for. Yeah. And it, because um, I have a theory that teams will become clubs, like Manchester United is the biggest brand in football, it's not football itself. Do you see yourself becoming a club where <coughs> challengers and even amateur players and, or non-playing players can become a member, part of your, your fanatic club? Um, no. One, we don't really have a physical uh, location. Uh, we see Fnatic as a, a global brand, as a global uh, thing that people can support. Um, secondly, I would say, like, yes, we're a team brand, but we are want to uh, transpose ourselves, be, be bigger than a T brand. So an example is we launched Fnatic Gear, which is gaming hardware. So did Manchester United create their own football boots and foot? Maybe, I don't know, maybe 50 years ago, I don't know, but uh, the answer is no. So for us, Fnatic is, is a brand that we want to be similar to esports, and that's how we work on you know, our positioning and scaling up. And so it wouldn't be a member club at all. It's something you feel you know, strongly about because of the players and the brand and you know the content that we produce. Yeah. When it comes to the esports space, what opportunities do you see for mobile games? Haven't already seen some success with Vainglory and Hearthstone in that in that category. Yeah, I mean, I think Vainglory is by far the best example right now. I, I mean, I can actually tell you it was the, you know the fastest growing mobile game on on Twitch in, in 2015. Um, I think mobile as a, as a device as well is, is ex, you know uh, extremely important in terms of viewership. 
Um, you know, we, we constantly refer to our audience as cord cutters. Um, so it, it's the viewing experience is not limited to, you know, you're, you're in lounge kind of like home experience. You can basically broadcast and consume content anywhere. Um, but as a whole, I think it's too early to say, um, you know, where, where, where mobile esports is actually heading. And, you know, I think everybody knows where, where mobile games is heading. I, I would definitely question whether somebody would want to watch competitive Candy Crush, for example. But I think Vainglory is definitely the, the first step. And uh, nobody can quite say, you know, where that's headed. But, you know, the guys at Super Evil Omega Corp are doing a fantastic job. So, um, yeah. I would say it actually has great potential. And here's a few things, because people sometimes say, OK, well, what is potential of mobile? And then also compare to VR, for example. And sometimes have that discussion. But why are PC games so successful in eSports? It's because everyone owns a PC. So the, technical, the, the platform is there. Why is console less successful in eSports? Because you need to buy a console to actually play it. And also, from a techno technological uh, perspective, it's been more difficult to stream the content. So mobile, everyone's on a mobile. So the adoption rate can be really fast. And I think that's also what you see with uh, Vanglory. Here's the other thing. We, we sometimes think it's maybe a little bit awkward, people tapping on a screen, doing an eSports title. And we're so used to watching people actually on a PC playing eSports. But I think then reverse it. What if eSports was grown out of mobile and suddenly their PC eSports game? And we thought that we would think it all a little bit awkward, people sitting behind a screen you know, with a keyboard and a mouse, which you use basically for word processing and uncertainly doing eSports titles. So I think it's a matter of just get us getting used to it. And of course, for those games to develop a little bit better um, in terms of you know, the gameplay and so. But actually, it's brilliant, because you can see a lot more of the player himself playing. You can see more of the emotions. Maybe he's not hidden anymore behind a screen, a PC screen. So actually, I think it has great potential. Yeah. Well, in, in countries where <coughs> it's mobile first, so people experience the web uh, first by mobile, indeed, you see mobile esports taking off as if there's no question about that it will become big uh, as I showed before 24 out of 100 top grossing Android titles have esports activities next to it in China the top title being uh, was League of Kings I think of Tencent and then an iOS uh, fancy fast word journey um, in the Philippines particularly a crazy esports uh, country fastest growing or did you see enormous twitch viewership there they organize um, championships around Clash of Clans or any mobile title. So we're mobile first countries. I think, yeah, there's a good chance of success for the West. That's a big, that's a bit of a question mark. I mean, and you don't even need to break it down just into mobile. I think, you know, we've been talking about community this entire time, but Vainglory is definitely the you know, best case example at the moment, how the community were like, hey, we really want to watch this game. We can't really watch it. There's no spectator mode. And they were like, you know, building modifications just to be able to watch games. And then, um, you know, uh, Super Mega Evil Corp basically saw that and said, great, you know, we're going to build that functionality into the game for you guys. So, you know, great example of developer listening to community, and it's on mobile. And that's the, that's the best thing about that. What opportunities remain for those sponsors and brands that haven't jumped into the esports arena yet? I'd say that you know, as esports kind of reaches now its, I'd say, maturity and starts to really have um, some um, um, legitimate, real global dominance in terms of its size, reach, etc., to a point where it almost can't be ignored. Uh, this is where you actually see kind of the switch that you see, see in most you know classical um, organizations. So if we look at motorsport. You know, 1950s, you know, it's all Castrol and Pirelli and Dunlop. It's all the endemic brands that are close to motorsports. But at a certain point in the 60s, 70s, you know, it's Tag Heuer, it's MasterCard, it's whatever, because things change and the, the appetite um, for changes. And whether you like motorsports or not as an advertiser, you don't care. It just reaches a lot of people. We're now at the point that if you're interested in reaching let's say millennials, if you're reach, uh, interested in reading digital natives, there's very few other places than, for example, Twitch, the ESL where they're hanging out, where you can really f uh, find and talk to them in a, um, shall we say, an authentic uh, way. And so I think the, the, the sponsorship is, is now really going to hit its own stride. And you see that with the likes of Tosinos, Domino's, T-Mobile, stepping into the space now and saying, we want to be involved in this. They have very little idea how they want to be involved, which is fantastic, because it means we get to work with them. Um, but ultimately, they just say, we want to have a place within this ecosystem, because we now see that this ecosystem is large enough to warrant us having to take it seriously and be involved in it. 
and you know, the, the likes of the endemic sponsors will always remain there, but of course now we open the door and usher in a new time of, uh, of more of the mainstream uh, sponsors. Um, I, I think we, we only have scratched on the surface yet with uh, sponsors, so of course we work a lot with sponsors and a question I recently got is like, show me your, your most brilliant campaign you did with a sponsor. I go like, well, you know, we do very nice stuff, but we're not having like um, campaigns that we can, you know, submit for awards or so. Um, and the reason for that is very simple. I mean, we're still, of course, a fairly young industry. That means that we're all still, you know, learning and working with people who are very passionate about, you know, we're, we're building up experience. Secondly, but here's where Newzoo comes in, is like, how can we tell sponsors what the ROI is of their investment? Um, and that is something that we're still building up. And you have a party like Repucom, who is very, very much present in traditional sports, and they were, where they have worked out the ROI models, but it's not yet really present for esports. And um, you know, thirdly, also in terms of the potential, yes, we get interest from the music industry. Yes, we get interest from um, uh, you know, there's traditional sports, etc. So there's a very interesting mix of things that we can do with esports. I think which will be very exciting as well. You know creating content and, and um, you know, reaching out to this audience. And uh, we're just working on, you know, basically as hard as we can to develop that. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, advertisers are definitely, you know, they've taken note of the industry now. I think they're learning of the opportunities now, you know, whether that be to sponsor teams, um, uh, organizations, tournament organizers, and so forth. Um, and, and, you know, you can go back to the root. Advertisers are looking for that millennial audience, right? And, you know, I can tell you on, on Twitch, it is predominantly 18 to 34. Um, it is 75% male, 25% female. Um, and, and advertisers are, are, are realizing now, hey, great, that, that's, a, that's a real um, avenue for us to, to explore. And, and they're doing that with the help of tournament organizers, teams, and, and, and uh, platforms like Twitch. I think what, what helps is a recent um, influx or interest from traditional companies. Like back in the room here, I saw him, uh, obviously was the chief marketing of the local, the biggest stadium in Holland, for instance. The Bundesliga is a client of ours. And, and, you know, and the fact that ESPN is sort of interested, that helps for the, 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 the brands that have always been advertising with ESPN. Oh, it, now it's the time really to step in. That helps a little bit. Um, we see a lot of brands calling us to say to quantify the opportunity uh, a lot more than uh, recently. I think what the opportunity also is, is to tap into local marketing budgets. So the majority of advertising money is spent on a country by country basis. <coughs> now uh, eSports is completely global. So do you have enough reach in individual countries to tap into that money or not? <coughs> and I think that is when it, growth will start accelerating in those revenues if that, if that happens. But maybe that's something for Sean. Do you, do you have national, are you tapping into national marketing budgets, do you feel? Absolutely. That's good, man. <laughs> We're trying our hardest. No, um, it, it's very simple, I mean, and everybody kind of touched on it. As, you know, this grows, esports is essentially um, a product that people have to get behind and want to be a part of, and whether it's a publisher, a content producer, a sponsor, what have you. And as it grows, and as there really now are numbers that are just, you know, just quite honestly mind-blowing both in terms of what uh, what can be reached and how that can be uh, how much market penetration you can get again in that uh, in that really core demographic um, that gives us a huge amount of legitimacy to it and with legitimacy comes over time the, the, the likes of you know let's say the the senior buyer of Procter and Gamble goes crikey you know 15 times now I've seen information coming by with massive numbers huge events teams winning crazy amounts of money all this stuff and they go I now after seeing it six seven eight I should now pay attention and get involved we're now at that point where that's actually we, you know the straw that broke the camel's back they're all kind of coming in and going how do we get involved in this space now how do we what do we do how do we get involved with Fnatic what's our role how do we how do we ride on their coattails and inter interact with their audience how do we work with the ESL of the mega events how do we get ourselves on that logo how do we talk and make that audience that's so incredibly uh, passionate and so once they're on board they truly love how do we get them spamming the chat with you know, a logo that means something that to, to all those people? Yeah. That's, that's where we're at at the moment. With, with some very traditional advertisers, it helps when I tell them that 20% of all video content in the world is games related, up to 25%. So you're already at so little amongst games. It, well, sorry, what did you say? I said so little. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you outside, John. Uh, but the, so they're already advertising there. It's just selecting the, the um, a cool thing within that space to do more, and that could be esports. But it's not that they're moving into a completely new space that they've never touched on. It's unavoidable, the whole games, uh, games like, videos. Yeah, and also here to add to that. So um, <clears throat> we, we also have more talks with sports marketing agencies and so on. In general, the message, that, or at least those that reach out to us. So, like, you know, brands are getting a bit bored with the traditional stuff and it's not evolving fast enough. And so, um, yeah, these are models that start to run out and kind of like start to lose a little bit of their value. So I think it's a very interesting point in time talking about sponsors right now. As you say, it starts to get on the global agenda and um, hopefully within the next year, a couple of years, we see some big movers coming in. Yeah. Yeah. And Twitch, uh, Twitch streamers are the new celebrities. Yeah, I was just going to actually. Yeah, that's it's, perfect. A, it's the heroes, Thanks. and they're looking Thanks for heroes. heroes. I was, was going to say that that, that yeah, whole kind of variety. Talk to you outside, Sean. <laughs> there you go. Do you want to go, or do you want me to talk about Twitch? No, no, I'll, I'll let you guys talk about Twitch. It's totally fine. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I definitely say that in mean, broadcasters, you know, instrumental part of, of the ecosystem as well. Um, but you know, I think the players, you know, the players, I, I think we shouldn't try and differentiate themselves too much. Um, and define them as two separate categories. The players are broadcasters as well. I mean, uh, you know, in, when, when esports was essentially growing, um, players were, were able to, to make a living on Twitch um, to, to really support their, their, their lifestyle, right? So that they could go to tournaments and, and, and play games rather than have to go out, get a job, then come back and practice in the evening. Um, basically, Twitch allowed them to, to monetize what they, what they did, which was actually just play the game. Um, and, and that's what spectators are looking for. You know, they're, they're looking for so many different things. And one of those things in esports is um, that high level of play. Right? They, they want to see people really excel at a game. And that's what pro players do. I think to that effect, I mean, the, the, whether it be the, the audience that, that's watching, consuming, the audience that's actually creating content, or the pro-level players that are creating content, it all kind of nestles very uh, closely into the trend that we have now of kind of selfie media, of people wanting to create, share, be close to their, whether it be their idols, their brands, their whatever, they want to hear directly. The, the, the kind of, that's the, 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 the time period that we're in at the moment with the likes of Twitter, you know, having such a, a massive role, and I think the likes of let's say Twitch being that platform where they can create, share, interact, you know, it just fits in so nicely and we're now, it's kind of almost again a, a perfect storm of elements that have come together to let esports kind of have this moment because we've got all these facets that basically foster this, this ecosystem that is what people are trying to enter their brands into. How do we sit in the center of this, you know, this vortex of Twitch, Twitter, uh, fans, uh, uh, audience, teams, etc., that are all buzzing around? Where can they have their role in that? And when you look at traditional sports uh, across the board, you, you have players unions. Uh, how do you see things evolving when it comes to players and teams in esports moving forward from, from that type of realm? Sorry. Players unions, you know, professional sports. Yeah. Um, no, also here, uh, no doubt about it. I see that as a organic or natural way and also necessary for, let's call it the industry, but for the industry to further grow um, because else you, you'll be limited um, by, you know, individual interest or so. Um, and I think that's another part for esports, um, whether it be players or teams or other parties, um, to organize themselves better. Um, and that just will help to further accelerate growth. Um, and not only this, it will also help to um, further develop, let's call it the whole esports proposition and go out to, as we just spoke about, either global brands or would it be, bro there's of course Twitch, but there are other parties in, you know, uh, interested. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, it's a natural way, something that we have to do and it will serve everyone's interest. From a league perspective, which yeah, are... I think you know, it's, it's not a question of you know, uh, um, will they come? Of course, at some point they'll come. But like all other elements that uh, that sit within esports, it's a it's a matter of them kind of reaching the maturity that makes sense. We still have so many different leagues and competitions, even around certain games. That how would you couple those organizations together? I mean, Fnatic is you know a shining beacon of what can be done, you know, and really at the very pinnacle best level of professional gaming. But there are a lot of organizations uh, that are out there that you know don't share that same kind of approach, where perhaps the players aren't being paid a fair wage and where perhaps the, the money from sponsorships isn't going back to the players but going into something else. 
while that's out there, those organizations aren't going to be eager to band together. The likes of, let's say, the top 10, 15 teams in the world, I'm sure they're already in some sort of communication and working out where it's going to be, and at some time, those kind of things will come to light. But as an entire playing field, there's still a lot that needs to kind of, you know, find its foothold, and as we find um, kind of, you know, let's say, mega leagues that truly uh, run the gambit for an entire um, uh, game, I think that will happen as well. But while there are lots of different leagues that are uh, performing, it becomes difficult because they all have different, you know, ideas and demands and rule sets and where the players have to do and what they can play for, can't play for. As that kind of all begins to um, solidify, I think definitely it'll come. When we look further ahead uh, at the billions of dollars that are currently being poured into virtual reality, what potential do you see with that medium and esports converging at some point? Yeah, um, so <clears throat> um, for me, the easiest reference I usually make is because I started my working career in semiconductors, actually. Um, and um, some of you might know it is ASML, ASML is based here in the Netherlands. But the reason for me pointing it out is they're building these machines to uh, produce microchips and um, it's always like how do you go from a concept to production uh, phase or production machine um, and that's a science in itself and I see somewhat similarities with VR it's like working very hard on the concept stage it's about the technologies the hardware it's developing games or content that would be fit for VR um, but bringing that from a concept stage to a full like a mass product and mass adoption I think that's a whole different science and that's something that still needs to be completely developed. So I think, you know, the concept is there, the potential is there, but the challenges to overcome is like, how do you let people, it's of course the, the technolo uh, technology, so the hardware that needs to be there um, in order to process VR, to stream VR, etc. No doubt that will happen one day. But secondly, is like, for what price will VR become available? Um, and if you talk about uh, esports, uh, then it's also how will the spectator exp experience be for esports in order to create still the millions of audiences? So I definitely think it has uh, potential, but I think the proof is very much from bringing it from concept to mass adoption. Does anyone else? Yeah, I was, I was just to add kind of to that, or second that, that thought. I mean, um, I think an important part, at least for us, is to realize that when we put on a, an event, like you know, the World Championships in Katowice, just in a couple of weeks, that can be watched pretty much for free, very easily, by everybody in the world, thanks to my dear friend here at Twitch. Um, that puts us in a bit of a unique position, um, whereas if you think about, let's say, a Beyonce concert, um, the interest of Beyonce and the people that are, are putting that that person in that stadium is to create money out of you buying a ticket there. I don't really have that worry so quickly, so I'm quite happy with us putting a you know virtual reality camera backstage on the stage in the middle that you from home wearing whichever the choice of you know the the umpteen virtual reality apparatuses there are put that on and view that that event from that point of view. That will come. It's not a question of if it will come at some point, and of course we welcome it with open arms. But as you know, so wisely points out, it's purely a barrier to entry um, at the moment. And Oculus Rift, I think, is you know several hundred euros. You know, to have that set up, you need a certain kind of rig or PC that's going to be able to uh, manage that. All those steps mean that it's going to be more difficult to do. But do people want it? I'm sure it's very interesting. Will it be a little bit like the 3D channel on my TV at home that I've watched once when I got oh this is amazing and then never did it again? I don't know, but yeah, at least it's definitely out there. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Um, thank no, you, no, thank you. That means everything to me. No, I, can, I can go. <laughs> I was in San Jose at an ESL event, and you were making virtual reality takes. And I think you know, screens are going to disappear, and in two generations, three generations' time, we're going to interact in a different way. That's clear. That's why Facebook is investing. They're all after patents. It's all for the long term. For the near term, it's it's great if they can earn some money with content. Uh, it's not going to be a lot of money for games content. I think some investors are in it for the wrong for the wrong reasons. They've been lured into it, or for the hardware sales. I think, right. I, I think in, in fairness, it's very similar to what we were talking about yeah. before with, um, you know, the likes of, you know, Activision stepping into that, that scene. You know, there's so much going on. Everybody can see that the, let's say, the snowball of, of esports in that world is really gathering momentum and everybody's figuring out how can I be involved in this? And to that effect, you know, a lot of these companies, they have deep pockets. They can roll the dice 
and take a chance and say, hey, I want to try this out and see. And maybe it might pay off. You know, I bought a bunch of virtual reality technology. Oh, it didn't work. People didn't like it as much as I thought, but I was ready just in case. That's almost worth it in that sense. And I think you see that across a, a, a multitude. Yeah. People don't want to be left out watching on the sidelines going, damn it, we should have yeah. figured out a way to, to have a, a role in there. And I think all those elements, you know, virtual reality, creating your own league, being able to create more content is just looking at what's successful at the moment. It sits very closely yeah. to uh, what's yeah, been created at Twitch and how do we get involved. There's a side uh, product that I saw you, you guys make with the virtual reality stuff. You have these 360 videos, you know, that Mark Zuckerberg is promoting on Facebook, and they are super cool. So if you have a live stream or whatever, or, or 360 videos of eSports events, I think there's, that is directly usable, and it's usable for every indie and stuff. You can do really cool stuff with that. And again, all those elements are something that they test. Do they mean that tomorrow we're going to stop doing what we were doing? Well, I mean, it's the same as, as you know, terrestrial television. You know, a lot of people would say, okay, that doesn't have the strength that it has now when I can watch things on demand and as I choose, but it's not the hard cut that one just was d done and the other one came. There's always, you know, it comes in waves as one kind of ebbs out and another one steps in and it has more importance. I think the idea of being able to, you know, um, watch and consume, you know, people playing a game the way you are is a different, uh, unique proposition to watching um, pre-recorded content on YouTube. Both of them live in the same ecosystem. I think people will still say, I'm going to go and watch, you know, regular on my TV, sitting on my couch with a bowl of popcorn. But that doesn't mean that a person won't be sitting two houses down with a VR apparatus on, walking around a virtual stadium, virtually high-fiving players. And I think there's a place for that, that too. I would say still, again, in, in a sense of like esports, and of course, there's a little bit with the fanatic con context as we see it. I think it's absolutely key, like you don't create talent if you have not millions of users because, you know, like football and other sports, to get the real talent, so you need just to have a lot of people using it. And in a way similar with console, you know, consoles also develop more as a multimedia platform rather than just a gaming console and so. So for me that is still, you know, the question like, are, will, are people, millions of people willing to buy it and, you know, in terms of VR will absolutely be you know, a kick-ass product for a lot of things. Um, but for eSports, as we you know, see today, I think that, that is very key um, about it. Will it be available for the masses? Um, and will it create you know, the right talent or so in order to, uh, or, or will it be at a price uh, that people are willing to, to pay for it and maybe see some multifunctional use in it? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think there's so many opportunities long term in terms of the, the, the spectator functionality it offers. Um, but right, right now, in terms of, I think the opportunity probably lends itself more towards game developers. I think it's very interesting there, you know, how they will approach it and how that will lend to the spectator experience and the games themselves that they can develop, right? Um, I think that's very interesting. But, you know, to go back in terms of short-term potential for, for VR, I mean, we need to look at the ubiquity of technology. Uh, one of the reasons why Twitch was so successful was broadband, right? I mean, and, and um, I think we need to be careful not to, not to jump too far ahead. Um, but, uh, yeah, definitely one to look out for. Okay, at this point, I can open it up if anybody in the audience has any questions for anybody on the panel. If you raise your hand. Hi, I was wondering, so I get how uh, like a streamer or a YouTuber can make money because their cost of production is quite low just on broadcasting their content, but I was wondering for eSport, which costs a lot more to, to produce, of course, if you think in the near future it will be a sustainable business just to produce eSport content outside of just the publishers doing it, and if so, how they will make uh, money? Will it be from broadcasting rights? Will it be from advertising or anything else? If I understand you correctly, um, you are asking, you know, is it um, sustainable, interesting for somebody to create esports content as a small kind of, you know, one or two people potentially in their bedroom versus a large organization? Yeah, exactly. It's like football, for instance, people super, are willing super. to pay for games and stuff. So, I, I, I would, I would jump in and say it's, it's already, already happening. If you look at like uh, Dota, there are so many of what they call Dota houses, which are small, uh, kind of almost fraternity like organizations couple of friends that are working creating Dota Leagues just because of their, um, their passion and the, 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 the length of time and their, in a game like Dota you can show how many hours you've played which is almost like a badge of honor so if you have you know, many hours under your belt you already have the respect of your community if a couple of people with these large playing you know, history logs in the game say hey we're going to create a tournament from our bedroom people will come in and watch that and the audience that's watching it on Twitch 
are, I wouldn't say um, oblivious, but they're not as excited or interested about was that created by you know, a professional organization or by two or three guys, again, in their bedroom. Um, and the audience that's watching that, consuming that, the numbers can be huge. So then ultimately, for that classic moment that I said before of it you know, jumping to a, um, a non-endemic sponsor wanting to get involved, they're just going to look and say, there's you know, 100,000 kids watching those two guys in their bedroom creating content on Twitch. I still want to advertise around them because I'm still reaching that same number. So for that point, that's actually one of the reasons it's so successful. Yeah, I mean, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, Sean's absolutely right. It, it is already happening, um, and it's already happening at a local level as well. And you know, just to give you a little insight, we can break we can break down a uh, the the revenue streams that a specific, specific broadcaster or studio has. I mean, on Twitch, for example, um, they they monetize their content through a partnership program, so that allows them to monetize through standard video advertising, so pre-roll, mid-roll. They advertise uh, they they monetize through subscriptions, so they build a subscription product that their viewers and community can subscribe to. Um, there are a, a number of uh, affiliate programs on Twitch that they 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 utilize. For example, the Amazon affiliate program, we partnered with Teespring so they can even design their own t-shirts. Um, and, and that's just Twitch, right? So that, and outside of that, you, you see endemics, you see a lot of non-endemics now entering the space, sponsoring these studios and tournament organizers, and, and it's happening at that local level. So, uh, you know, we touched upon um, the, the local level a little bit earlier, but you will find countless studios and, and tournament organizers that uh, are reaping the rewards of, of a sustainable ecosystem, which, which is what it is already. Um, from my end, I would say like it, it, you, um, they don't really exclude each other. Meaning, I think what you're more talking about is you're really going more to the entertainment side of you know gaming, and you know of course for us it's a little bit different. And when you ask a question, I think so. I have, I have two small boys; they're four or five years old, and and they watch like countless hours of Lego, uh, the Lego games. You know, um, they're one of those guys that are just bloating up the viewing numbers because they watch it over and over again to the level they go like, why, why are Lego games not on Twitch? Um, but, you know, I'm sure these guys that put their content out there, they, do, they probably do really well. So yes, you know, there's, there's a very good opportunity for that. Is that eSports for me? No, of course, I take a little bit of a more exaggerated example, um, but Again, you know, if you look at the esports, there's the entertainment side of the of the spectrum, and there's the very competitive side of the spectrum. And I guess, you know, even as you point out, out of your room, there's a very good opportunity to be a bit more on the entertainment side of things. Um, so yes, um, that would work very well. Hi. Uh, do you think that there are certain methods of monetization that can hurt um, the the uh, um, um, attractiveness of a title for esports, like for example, League of Legends, adding more and more champions to a point where it's not feasible as an esports title anymore. Uh, I mean, the the two elements that we come up against obviously are balancing. So obviously, when you add, as you, as you mentioned there, you know, new characters into a game, it's how do you make sure that they play nicely in that kind of classic rock paper scissors kind of environment of a game gameplay. That you know, that to every action there's a reaction. It can be balanced and it keeps that kind of uh, the fun element uh, of you coming back. And of course, the second part is you know that if you're actually paying to win. So if I can go out and buy something that makes me um, overpowered against the other people that I'm playing with, that's um, you know quite simply not really the most um, um, healthy um, elements for any kind of competitive play. So those are the two that I would say are, are the danger ones about putting um, money in onto, into monetization on that. But I don't know, you guys might have different examples? Um, no, not really. I just believe in voluntary payment. People want to pay. It's not a bad thing, you know. People just give them possibilities to pay and a variety of possibilities and if you do a good job entertaining them they will spend money you know you, you can raise money have a, the next level paid by your own community if you want or um, so voluntary payment I think is is, is the way and, and it, again it involves the community right so I mean the community is directly funding and supporting these events and that's that's what makes it so special so yeah I definitely want to see it as a major negative well thank you very much everybody. okay well thank you very much for the panel great job okay.